What is social construction? What do we mean when we say some entity or some phenomena was socially constructed? Let's find out. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Attic. My name's Mark Jago. I'm a philosophy professor in the UK. In my previous video, I gave some suggested summer reading on topics in social construction. And I got a bunch of questions here on YouTube, on Twitter, with people asking, well, what do you mean by social construction? What kind of theories are we looking at? How does it kind of come about and what effects does it have? OK, so in this video, I want to take you through kind of explaining what I mean by social construction, take you through some examples of entities or phenomena that have been explained as socially constructed entities and trying to think about how some of those theories work. I'm going to do a follow up video in which I go deeper into the metaphysics, the ontology of social construction. So they're really thinking about, OK, when some entity is socially constructed, kind of what is it in the world? What makes it the kind of entity it is? What kind of existence and reality does it have? But I'm going to save all of that for the follow up video. In this video, I'm really just going to talk through some examples of entities or phenomena that are or at least have been thought by philosophers to be socially constructed. OK, so if that sounds interesting to you, do me a favour before we get going. Hit that big old thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon to get notifications. OK, so very roughly when we're talking about something, some entity or phenomena or whatever being socially constructed, we're talking about something that is real. So it has causes and effects. It, it exists. But it's not or it's not just an objective physical or chemical or biological entity or event or phenomena. OK, it's something else. And it's something that comes about that exists and continues to exist kind of because of the way that we as a society are, the way that we think, the way we talk, the way we conceptualize the world. OK, so that's quite a vague and quite abstract definition. So I'm just going to give you some examples and talk through the ways in which they're socially constructed. So I'm going to start off with some examples which are pretty obviously social constructions. And then I'm going to move through into some examples that are perhaps a bit more controversial. OK, so let's start off with a classic go to example of something that's socially constructed money. So if you take a five pound note out of your wallet and think, what is it I've got here? OK, what is it? Well, it's something that holds value. It's something that allows you to exchange that piece of paper for goods or services or whatever to the value of five pounds. It's a mechanism for exchange. That five pound note holds value. It allows you to buy things. Now, that piece of paper itself intrinsically doesn't hold any value or at least like a tiny, tiny bit of value as a piece of paper, let's say. But, you know, you can't write on it. It's pretty useless aside from the value that we as a society put in it. So when I'm saying that that piece of paper doesn't have any intrinsic value, I mean, in and of itself, it's kind of useless. OK, it only gets its value as a as a bit of money as something that I can use to exchange because of all of the things that society is doing around it. And there's a couple of ways in which we can make this really, really vivid. One is just to think about all of the different ways in which you can have something that's five pounds. Right. You might have a five pound note. You might have five pound coins. Or you might have something on your bank statement that says you've got at least five pounds there and you've got a card and you can tap your card or you can do Apple Pay or, you know, whatever. So you've got kind of coin money, you've got paper money and you've got digital money. All of these are completely equivalent 
five pounds, right? It doesn't matter if you go into a shop and pay with your five pound coins or with your five pound note or you, you do it on your debit card. I mean, like if they accept all those things, then there's no difference. Maybe some shops don't accept them all. But, you know, just think about the case where they accept all of those ways of payment. All of those ways are equivalent five pounds. OK, it's the same five pounds, however it's going out. But they're obviously not the same physical entities, right? In one case, you've got five lumps of metal. In one case, you've got one piece of paper. And in the other case, you don't really have anything physical other than kind of whirrings going on in a computer somewhere. So the physical realisation of that five pounds is kind of irrelevant. It's just that, you know, we count certain physical lumps as holding this value. But it really only has that value because we say that it does. Another way of bringing this out is to think about what happens when bits of money go out of circulation. So if you go back in time, you'll find paper money that was like way bigger. So I remember five pound notes being bigger and then you go way back and there was like one pound notes and they were like big old things. And there came a point where those pieces of paper were taken out of circulation. So at the assigned date, literally just before that date, they would be worth a pound or five pounds. And after that date, they would be worth nothing. And nothing intrinsic to them changed. I mean, it's still the same piece of paper with the same markings. And all that changed was the rules and regulations that we as a society, or the Bank of England in this case, wrote down governing how those pieces of paper could be used and exchanged in our economy. Let's move on to our second example of socially constructed entities, disabled parking spaces. Now, at first, this might sound like a bit of a weird one because a disabled parking space, it's something that's that's there, it's physical, it's got a certain size and shape to it. How is that socially constructed? A disabled parking space is something that has to be marked out in a certain way. It has to be marked in a way that marks it as a disabled parking space to let people know who can and who can't park there. And the, the marks that we use, they are something that we as a society give meaning to. OK, so we, we mark them out with kind of bright yellow hatching. We decide that that's the way that we're going to mark out disabled parking space. And when you do that, when you take a bit of tarmac that is otherwise just a plain old piece of tarmac, but you mark it out as a disabled parking space, it gains these kind of normative and ethical properties that it didn't have before, right? So before I could park my car there, but if it becomes marked as a disabled parking space, I now shouldn't park my car there. I shouldn't block it, okay? It's unethical for me to do that because I'm not a disabled person. We as a society can take some physical objects and kind of imbue them with moral and normative properties, like meaning that we can and can't do certain things with them after that. And that's something that we add to the physical world through social interaction, through writing down rules and through making up norms and ways of behaving, codes that we should abide by as a society. We can extend this kind of view to language in general. So we don't just think about language as a bunch of sounds or a bunch of squiggles down on paper. That's just really the, the physical realisation of language. Language taken as a whole is something that has meaning. That's the whole point of language. It has meaning so that we can communicate with one another. But the meanings that words have are kind of arbitrary, okay? So we could have used the word dog to pick out the animals that go meow, and we could have used the word cat to pick out the, the, the animals that go woof. It was kind of arbitrary which way around we did it, but we decided to call cats cats and dogs dogs. We could have done it the other way around. As a society, the way we interact, the way that we use those sounds to pick out objects in the world and to communicate thoughts and ideas to one another, that's the way in which language gets its meaning. So to coin a phrase from Wittgenstein, language gets its meaning through use. The way we as a society use language to express our ideas and communicate, that that fixes, that determines the meanings of words and sentences. So that's a kind of social construction. So let's move on to some other examples now, perhaps more controversial, but I think more interesting ones. So thinking about things like gender and disability. So in social philosophy at the moment, the philosophy of social construction, an awful lot of the research is focused in on these kind of concepts. There's an awful lot of very interesting work being done here at the moment. I talked about some of that in the, the previous video with the reading recommendations. So I suggest you go and have a look at those if you're interested. I'm going to skip by gender here because that is a huge debate. It really deserves a whole video of its own and then some. I'm just going to say a teeny weeny little bit about disability. Again, I think this is something that, that seems 
at first a bit surprising to think of as a social construction, at least to able-bodied people, because maybe a lot of people's first reaction would be, well, disability, at least physical disability, that is a, uh, that's a physical matter, right? If somebody can't walk as long as an able-bodied person or they've lost a limb or whatever, you know, that's a, that's a physical matter, right? So why are you saying that disability is socially constructed. So I've been watching the Tokyo Paralympics. I've been watching the wheelchair athletes thinking, you know, I couldn't do that. I probably couldn't even push a manual wheelchair around for very long at all. Some people use them all day long. Okay. So there's something that this disabled wheelchair user can do that I can't do. And there's things that I can do that they can't do. I think of myself as able-bodied. They think of themselves as disabled. So why is that? Well, likely it's got something to do with what we count as normal in society, like walking around, being able to walk around. That's a kind of a normal thing. Uh, being able to push yourself around for long periods of time in a manual wheelchair. That's not something that we normally have to do in society. We don't need those abilities to navigate the kind of world, the kind of society that we've set up. OK, so this kind of explanation, it relies really heavily on what are the norms in society? If we had a completely different kind of setup to society, whereby uh, the normal mode of everybody getting around was going around in manual wheelchairs, then given that's the kind of ability that I don't really have, that society might consider me to be the disabled person and the people in the wheelchair as able-bodied. Okay, so it very much depends on what are the norms that we've set up in society that's going to determine who we count as being able-bodied, not able-bodied. This is a matter of setting up social norms, and that's what makes it a matter of social construction. Now, in saying that, we're not saying that we write the biological or the physical kind of stuff out of it completely, right? Because given the kind of norms that we've set up as a society, it's going to follow that somebody with various physical abilities will count as one thing, and somebody lacking some or all of those will count as not being able-bodied. Okay, so the physical, biological or whatever stuff does come into it. Just as in the case of the disabled parking space, we need a physical space that's big enough to fit a car in it. And then some, I can't just take a postage stamp and say, oh, let this be a disabled parking space. Saying that something's socially constructed doesn't mean that anything goes, that we can just deem something to be something and thereby it is that thing. Physical characteristics or chemical, biological, whatever characteristics will come into the story. The kind of theories of social construction that make most sense to me takes some physical or biological or whatever object and it adds to them various normative properties based on the way that we as a society interact. So it seems to me in these kind of cases I've been talking about, we've got entities or phenomena that are pretty obviously socially constructed. Now, what I'm not saying, what I'm not trying to talk about here is the more kind of extreme anti-realist or idealist view, which says that everything is socially constructed. I mean, that is a philosophical view. The idea that everything in reality is socially constructed through interactions of human minds or whatever. That's not a view that I have much philosophical sympathy for. For one thing, it doesn't seem to be able to explain that, you know, at one point there was a reality out there without any humans in it, right? Before humans or before any minds evolved, there was planets and stars and stuff like that, but there were no minds to think about them. There were no people to talk about them. There was no society. If everything were socially constructed, then no society means no entities, no nothing. But there was stuff. There was objective physical reality. There was a certain number of stars up there. Objectively, they weren't socially constructed. And they're not socially constructed now. So the kind of metaphysical worldview that I like, it allows that some things, yep, they're just objectively, physically out there. We don't socially construct them. But then other things, they get socially constructed. And they are the things that, broadly speaking, have kind of moral normative import. We, we take the objective physical world and through our social interaction, we imbue them with meaning, with norms. And, you know, I think the kind of things I've been talking about in this video are completely compatible with a broadly realist view of reality. I mean, there is reality out there independently of what we think about it. You know, the, the, the stars and the mountains and stuff like that. And then we as a society 
do some stuff through interacting and we bring extra stuff into existence and it has these kind of moral and normative properties. There's no real objection in any of that to a, a realist uh, view of reality. We're just allowing that there are different kinds of entities out there. Not everything has the same kind of metaphysical story as the objective physical stuff. OK, so I'm going to leave this video here, but in the follow up video, I'm going to talk an awful lot more about the metaphysics, the being, the existence of socially constructed entities. Like, what are they? What really makes them up, metaphysically speaking? So if that's the kind of stuff that you're interested in, I definitely am. I hope you are, too. Come back for the next video. If you've enjoyed this one, Thanks. Give it a big old thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Leave me a comment. Leave me a question down below. They're always lots of fun and I hope to see you for the next one. <laughs>